Um, having a lovely time here in Berlin at uh, FOSS Backstage, and we want to talk about something a little different. There have been certainly a number of talks about business, but um, in terms of business of open source, but the brands behind open source is something that many of the technologists of us don't think about as much. So as for me, I um, founded my own consulting company in terms of helping people understand open source from both business and, and the geek side. And I serve as a, the vice chairman of the Apache Software Foundation, so I've worked a lot with all Apache projects in terms of how they present their brands. And of course, they are open source brands, which is a little bit different than what we traditionally think of when we think of a brand or a trademark. Um, and just a disclaimer, because that's important in some jurisdictions, I am not a lawyer, neither in the EU or Germany or the US, so none of this is legal advice. Um, just reminding people that, so make, I don't get in trouble later on. So I'd like to talk about um, brands and trademarks and open source. And sometimes people think that they don't actually go together, and they do. They absolutely do, and it's very important to understand that, and many people don't understand the details. Why trademarks matter. It, it really does matter to your project if you want to succeed over the long term. Um, and one metaphor that's going to be important is we all talk about open source, but that's sort of a, that's a broad term. There is a specific definition, but it means a lot of things to different people. We really need to talk about three different levels of how open a project, whether it's a community or a code base, can be. Um, I think will be very valuable. And we'll have quiz time. So some of this will be surprises in terms of, do you actually know who owns the brand behind different projects? From my perspective, um, code, community, and brand are the three, w one way to think of any project. And we talk about the rest of Berlin Buzzwords and Apache Roadshow is talking about code. That's the least interesting. Uh, if we're thinking about projects and community and something living over a longer period of time, open source is infinitely forkable. That's by design. Uh, you know, I have my code, you have your code, it's the same stuff, it doesn't matter. Community are the people who drive a project. They're the activities that are happening that are vibrant, that make something interesting, have it have direction. Um, that's constantly changing because companies decide to internally make a different business decision or because volunteers, you know, have an emergency at home, can't show up, or volunteers are suddenly very passionate about things. Brand is the image of the whole project, and that's far more powerful than we think of, it, for most of us, in our day-to-day -day life when we're working in an open source project, or when we're at work and deciding which technology to use. And I often find it's the least understood in most of our communities. Now, certainly there are some... So, are there any marketers here today? Okay, so you, you guys, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not going to teach you anything. But the rest of us, I think, don't think about that side as much. So I will posit that an open source project's most important asset is its brand. So um, we'll see at the end of this talk if you, you know, agree with me or you think I'm crazy. Right now, you probably think I'm a little crazy because cool technology or great people. But so let's think about some popular open source brands and then uh, figure out who owns them and who actually is behind some of the brands in our project. So we have a quiz time. I don't have to be you know, extra big because it's right before lunch. I want to make sure you stay awake, okay? So we are going to go through who owns this brand or this trademark. So who can actually control the brand? Immaterial of the code, immaterial of the community. So here we have the lovable Hadoop elephant, which I have brought along with me. Um, not for sale. Uh, so who owns this brand? Is it, is it that cloudy company? I can't remember the name. Um, is it that Hortony company? I'm not going to say the name. Is it a business trade association, sort of something like, like the Linux Foundation, where it's companies together? Is it a nonprofit charity, like Apache or the Software Freedom Conservancy? Or is it Doug Cutting? Okay, because it was Doug Cutting as they actually named it. So who owns this in terms of the brand image, in terms of what it is? Well, hopefully, we had thought of the right answer, which is a nonprofit charity. So Apache Hadoop is a registered trademark of the Apache Software Foundation. And in the US, we're a 501c3, which means we're, we're truly a public charity. We're not beholden to any corporate interests. Um, so here's another question. Who owns this brand, which I think most of us recognize? We may or may not have played with the little Arduino computers. but who is behind 
use of the trademark? Who is the, the person who can legally control um, how we, or how somebody presents it? I mean, obviously there are a lot of developers working on it and hardware manu manufacturers. Is it really a commercial company that is trying to make money? Is it a trade association um, who want to build ecosystems, but really it's the member companies that are controlling them and benefiting from that ecosystem? Is it a nonprofit charity or is it a BFDL or an individual? So that's a benevolent dictator for life. So there are some open, popular open source projects where essentially the, the person who founded it has sort of a, an, a, a perpetual veto over things and they act as a, as a leader for the project, which is implicit. Um, they often, you know, they invite other input, but they have the final say. So this one is actually interesting because there was a lot of, um, controversy over this, because there actually were two Arduinos for a while in different countries, and they started suing each other over the trademark, which is unfortunate, costs a lot, and uh, detracts from the work we want to do. So now they have, uh, about two years ago, they finally stopped fighting in court over trademarks, because that's never a good idea and it's expensive, and actually finally talked and decided to merge the ownership. So currently, this registered trademark, Arduino, not the logo, but the, the name, is owned by Arduino AG Switzerland um, as a registered trademark, and they are a commercial company, and they have worked to bring their community back together, which is a good thing. But they spend a lot of work um, fighting back and forth over trying to sell these Arduinos and that, those Arduinos, and in trademark law, you can't do that. Hopefully, this is a simple one. Um, the world's most popular blogging platform. Everybody recognizes this, I hope. So who owns this brand? Well, that would be another nonprofit charity. So we all know that Matt Mullenweg founded this and is a sort of a leader in the, within the project, but they founded a separate nonprofit foundation, WordPress Foundation, who owns this trademark. Now, Automatic, the company that hosts WordPress and that's the commercial company behind it, shares a lot of the people and a lot of the directors, the leadership, as the WordPress Foundation. But legally, the nonprofit owns the trademark, which is an important distinction because then they can hold it for the community and the better, better good. So you might say, okay, those are kind of interesting. We, we recognize them, I didn't know X, but why are brands important, right? Um, because brands, the, the public perception of your project that's how the public hears about you. That's how newcomers will find you when they're searching or will hear about you at a conference and decide to go look. Open source is fundamentally an attention economy. So in terms of the projects, we rely on getting enough attention so that people will use us, which is great, will give us feedback, and will become committers or contributors so we can improve our project. Right? We don't have a company behind us that can decide to hire more engineers. We need to be visible and attract people. But brands overall, I mean, we can talk with marketers, but that's a huge topic. That's kind of out of our scope. So let's drill down a little bit in terms of a brand is everything you think about the logo and the name and the way things look. And a trademark is a very specific thing. So I, my phrase is, a trademark is the legal instantiation of a brand. So there's no law about brands, but there are very specific laws in every country about use of trademarks. So here's where we have another little secret game. Uh, look around you, and I'm going to go to the next slide, and if we're going to spot the lawyers, because when I go to the next slide, if there are any lawyers in here, they're going to twitch, okay? So keep an eye out, right? So we're going to go over trademark law in 30 seconds. Okay? Now, any trademark lawyer would be like, uh, but, so a trademark is, is the legal instantiation of a brand. So there's law around it. It's a very specific, trademarks are very specific and consistent symbols. So around many open source projects, there's, you know, how we talk about um, Drupal or the latest release or the code name for the latest release or the little blue icon for it. Those are all different parts. The trademarks are the little icon, and the word Drupal. The rest is part of the brand, but the trademarks are the very specific thing of how we associate uh, a name with a good or service. And really, the hard part about thinking about what trademark law is really trying to do 
is as us, as producers of open source, it's not really trying to help us. I mean, it does help us, but trademark law is really designed to prevent consumer confusion, user confusion about the source of goods. It's about our image to the world, and we have a legal definition of a specific part of this image, the name of our project, and associating the users who will see that image then can understand that software that comes from Drupal comes from the people behind Drupal. And it's not some you know, random SourceForge user who's uploaded some Drupal whatever and you download it and it's not what you thought. Okay? Um, trademark law is really about associating that symbol in the minds of a user or consumer with the organization that's providing that product. That is what trademark law is for. And that's easy to see in terms of physical goods, like Coca-Cola. If it has that shaped bottle, you know it came from Coca-Cola, and you know how it will taste, because it's not somebody else. Um, the important part there is that consumers associate a trademark with a producer that has consistent goods for whatever the product is, which means trademarks by law and by function can only be owned by a single organization. So there can only be one legal owner of the Hadoop name, at least in each country, every country has their own trademark law, um, who that symbol is associated with that, that organization or country or company or individual. So you can use trademark law to prevent other people from using the name Hadoop for a software product. But to, to sort of put all that in simpler terms, why are trademarks, this part of brand, important, is because trademarks are not forkable. So code is designed to be forkable. Community can split off and fracture because people want to move in different directions, whatever. Trademarks cannot be forked. Um, you can try, and somebody can you know, point you out in the marketplace and show you're a bad actor, and somebody can come sue you, um, which will happen, but uh, is not usually a good idea to do. The, so the point is, um, whoever controls the trademark legally, and, and usually in the marketplace, is where people will come for that product, and then they will get the source from there. So you can fork code all you want, but people aren't going to follow you to that new fork. So the important question is then, when we're trying to evaluate a project we want to use, or that we want to contribute to, spend our time on, who owns the trademark behind that project? And that's not always clear. We often know some of the people working in the, in the open source community, um, but we don't always know who's behind the scenes. So here's an um, old-fashioned one. Do people remember this? Or is this like we've already gone past our social consciousness? So who owns this long-lived open source brand? Is it a commercial company? Is it a trade association, which is like the Linux Foundation? Is it a nonprofit charity, like Apache? Or is it an individual person, a benevolent dictator? Well, that's a trick question a little bit. It's owned by a commercial company, by Oracle now, um, and it's not open source. Solaris, as, as a product, is no longer open source whatsoever. So that kind of doesn't count. And that's because Oracle owns the trademark. They bought it from Sun, and they decided they didn't want it to be open source anymore. So they stopped, they changed. Nothing you do about that. So maybe we're thinking about a new database technology for something we need. So who owns the lovable MariaDB seal? Is this commercial, nonprofit, individual? So we want to consider if we're going to invest in using them as a technology, what's their future direction going to be? And whoever's behind the project, not just the people working on it, but whoever's behind it, controls some of that. Well, in this case, it's MariaDB Corporation AB. This is owned by, the trademark is owned by a commercial company. Now, there is a MariaDB Foundation that governs much of the uh, governance and work that happens in that project. But a commercial company owns the trademark. So this is the opposite of WordPress earlier on. The commercial company, if they decided to, could essentially change the direction because they own the trademark. So why is this important for your company? If you're thinking of using a software product or investing it. Well, understanding the brand ownership or the trademark ownership is risk management. So understanding who's behind it, where they're going. If they're a commercial company, they may well be a competitor. And that may be an issue if you end up wanting to really get into the project. 
Um, understanding the, the project velocity and maintenance. So is, is there a really solid community behind it or a big company? Uh, or is it you know, not necessarily defined yet? So over the long term, that may make a difference of where the project goes, how well they maintain it. And a key one is if you want to change the technology, so you want to add something and make that a value add or market dis disruptor, then when you contribute to that open source project, will you be able to have a say in the future direction, right? Whoever, both in the c code and community level, but as well as the brand ownership, are they willing to give you a seat at the table? Or are they a commercial company who will say, oh, that's great, we, we love your code, and we're going to go do this? So uh, we'll just do a couple of quick examples. Who recognizes this brand? Does anybody recognize this one? I just want to see, a little bit esoteric. This was the node forward fork of Node.js. So early-ish on in the Node.js lifetime, uh, a bunch of contributors decided to fork. Of course, when they forked, they took all the code. That was great. They took some contributors, not many. But they couldn't take the name. So they had to come up with a new name and a new logo, which none of us remember now. So it wasn't very useful. Nobody followed them. They didn't last very long. They fizzled out. So do we recognize this brand? A little I.O. No, apparently not. Okay. Um, well, this was a major project fork from Node.js by some significant contributors who had real technical dif dif differences and went ahead and actually built some new and changed features in Node.js. So between 2014 and 2015, they were a separate project. They attracted some other attention, got some velocity, and then a few people decided, got them to agree, okay, this technology is better. Let's merge back. That was a good thing. But they spent a lot of effort building up that brand to get that attention that could have been done, could have been still in the same project. So having to use a new brand is, is expensive. Who recognizes this brand, which is more recent? Oh, yeah, it's a couple of people recognize this one. That's great. Because uh, this is AO, or pronounced IO, JS, just like the last, that one. If you pronounce it, they sound the same. This was a fork of Node.js, again, in 2017. Now, some contributors had uh, social differences and community governance differences with the Node.js leadership. So they forked because they had a better way to do things. Took all the code, had to come up with a new name, and to be frank, not really many people followed them. Their last commit was in December of 2017. They're effectively dead. But again, if they had kept their energy in the main project, it would have been much better. It's, it's much harder to, to go out and create your own brand and then try and get the same richness that something like Node.js has. So who recognizes this brand? OK, that's just a silly question. That's pretty obvious. The people in the Node.js project. Uh, that's the Node.js project. But let's go back to my earlier question. Who owns this brand? Or the trademark behind it, rather. Let me be specific there. This is the one that nobody successfully forked. Everybody en either ended up dying or coming back to this same root project in terms of the trade. So this one, I, I was surprised when I finally figured this out. A commercial company owns this trademark. And I just heard somebody in the audience go, oh, so I'm glad I've surprised somebody. Um, Node.js is under, the code governance is under the Node.js foundation which is part of the Linux Foundation. So essentially, the project governance is under 501c6 Business Trade Association. Right? That's what people think about. But when that all happened, uh, Joyent Incorporated, who originally founded Node.js and brought it to the Linux Foundation, they kept control of the trademark. And by the way, Joyent Incorporated is actually owned by Samsung. So legally, Samsung owns the trademark rights to Node.js. Does that matter? I don't know. Probably not, because the project's well enough established in its core. But you know, if you're a serious competitor to Samsung or something, they might not want to let you in. So um, here's the. Uh, I've done research. Uh, I apologize to my European colleagues. I've done research into U.S. trademark ownership. Um, this one, I'm confident, is also owned in the EU. But uh, here's the actual URL to look it up. Um, so imagine if. One way to look at it is imagine if all the efforts and all these forks had gone into innovation together. If they had, either, they had been able to continue the project velocity 
with the existing project. Um, that would just be cool. Um, and how hard it was for the forks to gain enough attention to be viable, to be interesting. They spent a lot of energy coming up with a new brand and then getting the attention, which wasn't energy on what is the code going to be and how are we going to solve more problems. Um, so understanding who's controlling the brand is un important to see sort of, you know, will you be able to influence the strategic project direction or not? So we're at FOSS Backstage where we're individuals who participate in open source, most of us. So why is this important to me as a contributor, right? Why do I care as an individual um, that I want to get involved in a project or use it or start a consulting business about it? That's another question. So on our side, um, you want your voice to be heard, right? If you're going to go submit code, if you're going to step in, you want to be able to know how can I participate in project governance, right? Do, is there a way that if I show my merit that they'll elect, elect me as a committer, that eventually I can be on the advisory board or the technical board for this project? Um, and to another degree, a lot of open source engineers, this is part of our resume. This is part of our, you know, brand. So will we be able to show reputation that we get in this project? Will that be valuable outside to other people, right? That, that we were like, yes, we're a Debian project contributor, right? That's useful because people understand Debian and they will welcome you in. If you are doing the work, they'll make you a contributor. There are some projects who won't. You know, they'll be like, great, thanks for the code, but, you know, you don't have a seat at our table. Well, this can be important. Um, here's another example. We have the Dapper Butler here, uh, who recognizes the name for this project. Little, uh, okay, couple of people, couple of people. Uh, this was uh, Hudson, a continuous integration server. Excuse me, it, it is Hudson. Um, not many people use it anymore. Uh, the trademark behind this is owned by a commercial company. It's owned by Oracle. So the story behind this is that some community members wanted to change functionality, add things to Hudson. Oracle wasn't giving them a seat at the table, um, wasn't letting them make the changes. So they could make the changes locally, but they wanted to collaborate on something new. So why is that important? You don't have a seat. But who recognizes this logo, this Dapper Butler logo? Uh, when the developers were unhappy, they forked the code, and they created a new brand, which is a little bit close to the other one. I mean, a trademark lawyer might complain about the butler standing that way, but it's Jenkins, it's not Hudson, that's fine. So the, the question is, they went and forked successfully, because several of us recognize this one and don't recognize the other one. My question is, who owns the trademark behind this? Somebody's, somebody's trying to have a guess. Um, this one is owned by a nonprofit charity. So the, the, I don't know, half dozen code contributors who simply said, we're going to go fork this, they forked it, they came up with a name, um, just as individuals uh, did the work and started getting popular, they went to Software in the Public Interest, which is a US-based nonprofit who owns you know, IP, sort of gives you a legal home to hang your hat on, um, can provide some fundraising and so on. But then the project community completely governs the code direction. And they're secure that, you know, if one individual gets bought by some big company, it, it's no individual who owns the trademark. There is an owner that's recognizable, it's registered. So uh, SPI, Software in the Public Interest, is a public charity. Their mission is to make sure it's for the public good. So they, they can't be bought out, really. A similar one is Drupal. So the cute little blue logo and Drupal. Who owns this one? Okay, we have a correct answer immediately. Uh, a BFDL, or an individual. So Dries, as an individual, owns the rights to this registered trademark. Now, the Drupal Foundation, which is a, a nonprofit, I believe, um, runs the project, has governance, um, does a great job, you can participate and, and have a seat at the table. But at the end of the day, Dries can say this new release is Drupal or not. Because if he says it's not, you can't use the trademark. So that's an important thing to understand that he's behind the project. And it works well in that case. But, you know, I mean, one question is uh, what's in Dries's will when he, you know, something not that I hope it ever happens, but continuity, 
that will be a question. So a way to think about how projects work and when a trademark ownership is really important and when it may, maybe it's not is to think, think about three levels of open. So it's not just we say open source and that applies to too many things. And of course, it's sometimes misapplied. So I like a structure where we have open source. And that's the actual definition is any public code that is released under an OSI approved license. So the open source initiative has a list of licenses that they stamp, they say it meets our criteria. And everybody I know who's you know, in the industry, that's the list we use. That means it's open source. Open governance. So is the project direction, is who can commit on to the code, is, how is that done? Is there a documented process? Is there a way that some new individual or small company can come along, contribute, and then get a seat if they have valuable contribu contributions? That we, we kind of get. You know, I'm, uh, there's Apache and Conservancy and Linux Foundation. They have the governance part. There are a lot of, pro of commercial companies that say, hey, it's open source but it's not actually open governance. They just don't say that. The third level, which a lot of people, we don't have a shared understanding of, is, is it an open brand? And that's the question of who owns the trademark? And I would posit that to truly be an open brand, the trademark needs to be owned by a nonprofit public charity. In the US, that's a 501c3. Um, in Europe, I'm not quite sure because they're all a little bit different, but it is a public charity. Right? Like the purpose of the organization is to serve the public good in some way, not to serve a specific you know, association of companies, whatever. So understanding we can fork source, communities come and go, trademarks only have one owner. Uh, so we'll come back to my original point, which is I believe that an open source project's most important asset is its brand. We have great code and technology. It's not an asset. It's free. Everyone can use it, or at least fork it. Um, we have a great community, but we're all individuals. We go different places. We're not beholden to our project. We have one brand, uh, and that is how the world comes to us and sees us. And that's the only thing that we can con a project can control the use of. If somebody misuses it, we can go after them. If somebody wants to fork, we can stop them from using our name. So really, that's, um, this is something I think that is a bigger conversation in the whole open source world, is we need to have this more. So uh, we can either do question time, or we can do some more quiz time really quickly with the last five minutes. Uh, do we have some burning questions, or should I go surprise you with some more uh, open source logos, uh, which ones they are? Both? OK, well, I have one, we have one question here who's uh, very eager. So you're recommending a nonprofit as the appropriate holder of the uh, trademark. How do you recommend we encourage our open governance to control how the directors or trustees or whatever legal arrangement it is of that nonprofit uh, make their decisions or to whom they are beholden when we make our questions? Because there's no necessity that that is related to governance in the examples you gave where the governance foundation is separate than the owner. Uh, yeah, so how do we think about project governance in terms of the code and the direction, and then ownership of the brand and governance of that? I mean, the best way is that sufficient of the technical leaders within the project who are, who are doing the work and effectively controlling direction are also part of the decision-making process for the brand. I mean, they. They, they need to be an overlap, right? They need to have some um, co combination. So you can either do it yourself and set up your own organization, or um, Conservancy, the Apache, Linux, Eclipse, all have a model for you, and then will we'll exist as a home for you, um, which will handle those details. But there are, you know, there are, there are little bits of um, how those foundations do governance um, that you need to make sure you understand and you agree with, or you don't. So just really quickly, who owns this brand? Little Tux, the Penguin, of course. Um, who owns the trademark behind it? Anybody know? Well, nobody really. Um, we can say uh, an individual, uh, Larry Ewing, drew the original Tux. So he owns copyright on this image. But uh, there was a, a trademark registration that was made 
for this specific image, but it's expired and nobody's done anything with it. And there are so many tuxes now, you couldn't trademark it because you'd be coming in after the fact. So there isn't a trademark here. But thanks, Larry, for drawing the, the penguin originally. Who owns? I made a, um, uh, I have an open source project which uh, covers CAN, CAN bus in Linux, and mm -hmm. we have some kind of CAN lines, uh, CAN wires um, below the, the penguin. The question is, we have this all on, on GitHub, for example, or on other things. Um, would it make sense to make this also some kind of brand or to, to mark it in, in some cases that people just um, stick to this as a project? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that's a more complicated question than we have time for. The one thing I'll say is uh, the, t the Penguin is so widely used that trying to make a new brand that you're going to really promote and defend that incorporates the Penguin, that's a risk because it's hard, it would be almost impossible to police use. So the interesting one is who owns this word mark, the word Linux. So we have a two-pronged answer here. Legally, Linus Torvalds, as an individual, owns many, I have not looked them all up, uh, trademark registrations on the word Linux. Now, he has chosen, quite wisely, to license them all to the Linux Mark Institute, which has worked with the Linux Foundation, to handle all the details, right? Which is great. But, and I'm sure there are some agreements that we don't see behind there, but legally, he as an individual controls this. I mean, de facto, it's the Linux Foundation. Um, but there are subtleties that, that make a difference when, you know, if there ever is a lawsuit. Uh, anyway, remember this one here, Sendmail? Way back when, you might, might remember. Um, this is actually owned by a commercial company. Not that it matters, because it's not a big deal now. Originally, it was created by Eric Al Allman, and who owned it as an individual, but he, his company sold out to somebody else, who sold out to somebody else, who actually maintains a registration on Sendmail, which, by the way, is a, a horrible name, because it's descriptive. So it's going to be hard to defend. Like, we all send mail. Can I send mail with my software? Of course. I can't have software that says just send mail. But So uh, this one is actually in the news. We had a great talk earlier this week about this one. So who owns this brand? That's a true question. Um, right now, Oracle owns this brand. They are in the process of incubating at the Apache Software Foundation. So within, well, a few months, it's lawyers, right? So it'll be a while. Within a few months, Oracle will legally transfer ownership of this registration to the Apache Software Foundation. Because the requirement at Apache is that Apache owns the trademarks. If you give us a project, we must have the trademarks. If you, if you hold back anything, that won't, that won't work. Um, I just have a couple more. Uh, who owns this brand? Well, this is OwnCloud, a local commercial company that does your own software. They had some differences within the company that owns this about where their project should go. Well, their company essentially, their company forked and created some of the developers, including the original leader, created Nextcloud. And of course, came up with a different logo and brand and created their own thing. But again, they had to fork the trademark. Um, but I find that fascinating that the commercial companies, you know, I guess as politely as possible did that. Um, we'll just do one more. This is another very popular one, right? So who owns Debian as a trademark? And here, it's, it is indeed a nonprofit public charity. So Debian, uh, who does all their own governance and is lightweight, they've decided to go to software in the public interest to ensure that their trademarks are protected by somebody who has a legal standing and who they can trust will not interfere. Um, with them. Oh, I'll just do one more. Um, this is kind of a tricky one, jQuery. Um, there's a tiny bit of a story. So originally, jQuery was a, at the Software Freedom Conservancy, which is a public charity, right? So they had gotten a project, they became popular, they're like, oh, we need to do something. So they went to Conservancy, which is a great place. They did their own governance, but Conservancy t handled the legal ownership and could have defended the mark. They decided to change direction and ended up moving to the Linux Foundation as a collaborative project there. So at this point, the Linux Foundation, which is a business trade association, legally owns the jQuery trademark. So that's a different, little different meaning. If you 
pay to play on that particular project at Linux Foundation, you can have a seat in governance, which is different than if you were at SPI. Um, and almost exactly on time, I am done and will put up my beautiful kittens and say thank you for attending. And I don't think we have time for questions here on the video, but I am happy to hang out afterwards. And of course, you will certainly be able to find me, I hope, later on. So thank you. <laughs>Yeah, many thanks, Shane. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we could have a few minutes. But oh, uh, certainly. If anybody's I heading to lunch now, okay. I, yeah. So um, you say that our, our brand is our most valuable asset as a project, and I was wondering if you have any examples that, that prove that, like things gone horribly wrong, uh, people projects got horribly burned by getting, you know, Losing control, for example. Um, yeah, I didn't. I, I enjoyed myself a little bit too much last night to have the examples on the tip of my tongue. Um, I mean, one example of not a fork, but your, your brand is important is GNOME, right? We all know that. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was an example where, I um, can't remember, not a software company, but somebody you wouldn't expect, applied for trademark registrations for. GNOME as a point of sale terminal. So GNOME is a Linux desktop, so we, we look here, right? So the, one of the, the, the things that this company provided as how they're going to use the GNOME name for these point of sale terminals at a, at a supermarket or, or kiosk was a picture of what looked like a computer desktop with some icons to you know, buy things and add your turf purchases up. Um, the GNOME Foundation, who doesn't really have uh, you know, trademark lawyers at their disposal, who doesn't have the expertise, said, hey, you know, this, they realize this can be a problem, which is good. They complained to the company. The company essentially stonewalled them. You know, the, the application is still waiting in the National Registry and eventually is going to go along the slow process and become a registration. And once you have a registration, it is far, far harder to contest it. So eventually, GNOME had to do a lot of work on their own, had to reach out to other um, FOSS organizations to get some legal support, and eventually had to go to the USPTO to file a formal complaint in the process, right? While they're trying to talk to the company. At, they also eventually said, okay, we have to pay our lawyers. They started a fundraising campaign and doing what press they could. At that point, the other company, presumably, actually had somebody who mattered come talk to them. And they were like, hey, we're this nonprofit, right? They look the same, same name. Uh, you can't do that. And it wasn't until there was a fundraising campaign and publicity that the other company backed down. I mean, that's kind of a flip side from what I think you, you're talking about, but that's one thing that's... They weren't, they weren't prepared to defend it, right? And they could have lost everything if they hadn't... You know. Yes, if the registration had issued, the other party could, couldn't directly have stopped GNOME from calling themselves that, but it certainly, they certainly could have caused a lot of trouble. So there's a whole world of trademark registrations and uh, the like that open source projects often aren't equipped to deal with. And, and we have several cases at Apache where when, when new projects come to us, we do a sort of basic name search on what the name they want to use is. And that's complicated because, you know, trademark law, there aren't hard answers in trademark law. Or actually, let me rephrase that. When we're talking about trademark law and conflicts, uh, so the conflict with GNOME or with Apache projects where there's conflict, I have, I have one answer. I can answer all your questions about trademark law like that. It depends. Um, what? <laughs> no, I just, I just play a lawyer on the internet. I'm not actually a lawyer. Um, but the, the complexity is there, and you know, oftentimes we don't think about it. There's one case recently where, um, at a major foundation where some you know, software company, but not really in the industries we're usually in, came and complained to this you know, seven-year-old recently well-known open source project with their lawyer saying, cease and desist, you may not use this, it's a simple name, you may not use this word for your project anymore because we have a registration for it. And we're like, okay, uh, we've been happily coexisting for seven years, I didn't really know who you were, and that's one thing. And the other one is, well, what exactly does your software do? What exactly does our software do? Would it, would it confuse someone to see 
you know, Foo software, would somebody know if they got to the wrong page? So one way to think about confusion in trademarks is uh, imagine you're searching for something, you kind of know what the product is, and you get to Foo software page, and it's actually from, you know, somebody in the middle of the country building personal management software instead of the business software you want. Would you instantly know you're on the wrong Foo? Or might you say, hey, this might be the Foo I want, and I go download it. That would be confusion. And the, the test for doing that is complicated. Um, I, think, I think part of the reason I'm having a hard time getting to what I think you're trying to ask about horror stories of projects who had a problem is a lot of these happen in private. So a lot of times it's there's, you know, either the project wants to do something or somebody contacts a project and says, hey, you're infringing on my other name uh, privately. And then they sort of wonder within themselves what to do. And it's not usual. You, you may not want to make a public case until you understand what the rules are. Um, so I think that's part of it. But that's a really good question. Hit me up later to, because I should, uh, go back through notes and sort of, that'd be a good blog post of adding things. Okay. Do we, I, I'm happy to answer more questions. Um, or hold more balloons. We have some balloons in the back. That's great. Nick. So this is my professional troublemaker. So be, be prepared. So thinking possibly more for the people on the video, where should they go to learn more for people who can't come and heckle you at lunch? <laughs> yes, uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you all for attending. Um, I post all of my slides on shaneslides.com. I'll post this up there. Um, I run a consultancy, Punder Things, and I am a regular blogger. And if you, basically if you, as far as I know, my name is globally unique. So if you can see this slide and type that in, you'll find me in a, any search engine. Um, there isn't a ton of great sort of how to approach trademarks information out there. There are a few sites that are worth the read. Um, I have pointers to them, and at the Apache Software Foundation, we of course have to help all of our 200 projects do this, and we have a really good trademark resources page at the ASF that has links to, we, have, we describe how we do it, and has links to some uh, you know, explainers of all this. So come to my site and come to the ASF's trademark resources page. Good. Thank you.